want to get to a, a little bit of a sharing this afternoon and something that I, I, I feel like I, I want to just release from my heart. I, I've been preparing, um, you know, for, of course, for today and in the past Sundays. And, and each time that um, I, I go away and lock myself in to just be in the presence of the Lord um, and to seek His Word, the, the, the thing with us as preachers and, and preachers who have been preaching for a while, it's not a problem of, of, of being able to preach. It, it's, it's, it's quite tempting to even just open the Bible and begin to preach from any passage of Scripture. And um, one, our heart's desire is that we would hear from God. Um, and that we don't just preach whatever we feel uh, we want to preach, but that we are being um, sincere and being faithful to what we believe the Lord is uh, giving us to share to the church. Um, in the past few Sundays, um, I, I've alluded to it a little bit at other times. Um, in the past Sundays, there's just something that I cannot get away from and, in fact, has only... Um, gotten stronger, this urging, this sense in my heart of what the Lord is wanting and desiring from the church, from His, from His children, uh, from the bride of Christ. And you know, it's easy, as I mentioned at the at the beginning, um, it's easy for us to preach just from any uh, portion of Scripture. But there's a real urging a real prompting in my heart um, that what the Lord is desiring um, from the church yes we can preach any message yes we can teach on any topic but there's a desire from the Father I really believe this with all my heart that there's a desire from the heart of the Father for the heart of his children to return to him in intimacy. That there's a heart, and, 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 and you know, even today as we were worshiping, I just kept seeing the picture of the story of the prodigal son. And we know that story very well, and we're all familiar with it, and I've made mention of it in other, in other Sundays that we oftentimes focus on the younger son and the mess he got himself into and and as he ran out of the fun and as he ran out of friends and money he came to his senses and he returned and repented and returned to the father or sometimes we focus on the older brother and his self-righteousness and his lack of uh, his being blind to all that he had with uh, with him that he had everything that uh, that was available to him yet that was not enough but really, the, the, the crux of that parable is, is, is not so much the sons, but a revelation of the heart of the Father. And I, I cannot help but get away from that even now. The, 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 the desire of the Father always looking into the horizon, waiting for the Son to come home. And, and you can only imagine, we, we're not told how long the, the younger son was away. We're not, we're not told in Scripture how many days, months, or years. We just know that he had quite a lot of resources. And, and I can only imagine that took some time to finally be depleted and even more time for him to, to be at the place of, with the pigs and finally coming to his senses and eventually returning to the Father. So I would imagine that this was not a matter of weeks or, or months. It, it most likely would have been a matter of years. And yet the Father, and yet the prodigal story tells us of a father that is always day after day looking into the horizon, waiting, longing for the return of his son. And I feel in my, in my spirit that that is today the father's heart for his church, for you and I, for, for the bride of Christ to return, not in duty, not in doing good works, but in our heart's posture. That he is desiring for his 
his children to return in true intimacy in relationship. See, we can make church about so many different things. We can make church about the programs, and, and I'm not against programs, and, and we should have some programs, and we can, make thing, we can make church about the fellowship. We can make church about the, so many, you know, the works that we can have in society and in impacting our culture. I'm all for that. I'm, I'm, I'm kingdom-minded. I understand the assignment and, and that we are to impact the community and the world with the kingdom of God. I understand all of that. But in this moment in time, I'm really, really sensing that, that the heart of God is not just for impact of nations or, or the expansion and multiplication of churches, but the heart of His church to return back to Him in tenderness and intimacy, a desire for Him. And, I, and, and that's just what I'm, I'm, I'm sensing even right now in this room, that the Father's heart is longing for your heart and is lo longing for my heart to return back to Him, to desire Him beyond what He can do, beyond what He can give, beyond what prayers He can answer, beyond the miracles that He can perform. We, he, is, he is seeking and drawing, I believe, He is drawing your heart and my heart to just desire to be with Him. We are pulled here and there our attention is so divided. And if you are going to be honest, and if I'm going to be honest, I know that staying focused is now becoming a challenge because there are just so many things going on in our lives. With the advent of, of technology, we are able to keep in touch with people that are on the other side of the world that are you know um, different time zones and 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 in order to do that some of us have to stay up late or get up real early in the morning so that we can do that we have jobs and we have careers we have side hustles we've got projects we've got you know church events to to attend to we've got so many things that are vying for our attention and our affection that my concern is that we have lost the place of first love and that's what I'm believing the father is calling the, his church back to is the place of first love to remember the place when we first encountered him how how our hearts were so tender towards him burning for him and and we would be so excited to get off work so we can get home no longer because uh, no, no longer so we can watch the basketball game on TV, no longer, you know, because of the hockey game or the football game or, or being able to just get away from work, but we are excited to leave certain places, leave work, leave school, so that we can spend time alone with Him to cherish that, that atmosphere of His love and His presence and His acceptance and His peace and, and hearing um, his, 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 his words of affirmation, hearing clearly the voice of of the Holy Spirit engaging with our hearts and speaking truth to us, speaking identity to us. We, the Father is looking for our hearts to be that again, to long for Him, for who He is and what He means to us. I was reading, um, as I was preparing for today, I've got my notes here, and I've got outline here, but I'm, I am hoping that I'll get to it. And as I was preparing um, for today, I was looking at this. I was looking at my Bible, um, by my Bible software, and, and I had my Bible open, and I'm, I'm reading. And I'm trying to, as a preacher, we're always guilty of it. When we're reading the Bible, we, we have a really, really bad tendency to start looking for outlines, to start looking for a, a message to preach. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I, I felt a check in my heart from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I just felt like I was going about it all wrong. Sometimes we can get into the Word and we can read the Bible to, one, get a message out of it, to maybe do a Bible study. Um, and sometimes we read it 
out of discipline, and there's nothing wrong with that. We absolutely need that. But I think what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me is that I can, He wants my relationship to go beyond just with the Bible, the book, and onto the person who sent authors to write a book for him. I, it took me some time to just stare at this, at the, at, at the scripture. And it began to dawn on me and really mess my heart up that this, is, this, this book that we call the Bible, this is not just a, this is not a fictional book. This is not a biography of someone, though it is that. That this is God speaking to me. That every invitation that we see there is God inviting you, inviting me to go beyond what we read in Scripture to a place of encountering the person of the Scripture. See, Jesus said it to uh, the religious leaders of his day, I believe it's in, in John, where he says, you search the Scriptures thinking that in it is eternal life. Yet they point to me so what Jesus is saying is that there were individuals, there were religious people, there were well-intentioned individuals that, were, that had a relationship with the text, but no relationship with the person. And I believe, and I know, that the Lord is calling us to, to understand, to a, a deeper revelation and understanding that it is He who is speaking to us. That, that, that it's not just black ink on white paper. That, that there is to go beyond that and to hear His invitation. This is God speaking to me. This is the Word of of God. And, and I know that we say that often and we quote that often, but think about it and think, let that, let that statement just find its way to be settled in your heart and my heart that when we open up the scripture, when we open up the Bible, it is God the Father speaking to me personally where I'm at, speaking to you personally. And when we, I believe, when we have that, when we allow that reality to sell in our hearts, when we look at Scripture, we will value it. We will cherish it. We will see it, not just something to get through and, 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 and check off the box, but we will cherish it like Ezekiel of all like it would be honey unto our lips he is drawing our hearts back to him as I mentioned earlier there's all of these things that are pulling away from uh, at our attention and our affection and not necessarily bad things evil things but there they are just things that consume our hearts consume our time, consume our attention. And I'm reminded of the verse in Psalms 23 where it says, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, in the midst of my enemies. You see, in that, I believe, is key to us going deeper with the Lord and, and, and having our hearts desire for Him again. He prepares a table, a banqueting table, a buffet, a, a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
And what he's saying is it's very relatable to us now where there's so many things that are trying to vie for our attention. In the same way, the psalmist says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, which means that the enemy is all surrounding him, but yet it is it, it takes a discipline for him to not be looking at the enemies that are around him, but to keep his gaze, to keep his eyes anchored upon the eyes that is sitting on the other side of this table. It's the eyes of fire that is burning with passion. It's the eyes of Jesus that is looking directly at me across that table. And it's going to take discipline for us to keep our eyes focused on Him and allow His eyes to burn within our own hearts that we would desire Him, that all of these other things that are external, that is surrounding us, would not even be able to grab a hold of our attention and our affection because we have, we have come to a place of disciplining ourselves and our gaze is upon Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe that that is also one of the ways that we could seek first the kingdom of God, to seek him first that all of these things that are vying for our attention would just fall to the wayside because our hearts are anchored on him he is after our hearts again the church can get so successful you know and this is what we have to be careful of the, the church can be successful and do many wonderful things, but yet lose and depart from its first love. You're reminded of that book, uh, uh, in the book of, of Revelation, that there was this church that was doing wonderful things, and, and Jesus was, was commending them for all their wonderful deeds and, and all of those things, but yet his, his, his accusation was that they had left their first love. And his encouragement to them was, go back to the things that you first did. And I believe that that's the call for you and I at this moment in time. That the Father is calling our hearts back to him. He's not telling us to stop the good works and, and the impact and all of those things. But the Father is calling our hearts back to him. With the time I have left, I want to get to my message today. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. Now, I've got three points here. I don't, I, we're not going to make it through all that. Um, I'll do one, and we'll make a series out of it. But in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, this is what it says, and I'm reading from the New King James uh, translation. He says, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed Again, this is that portion of Scripture that I was staring at throughout today. And this thought overwhelmed my heart. These words, follow me. You see, if this was anybody else, we can take it and kind of shrug it off. But it dawned on me who it was that was inviting me to follow him. In the same way that it is this same individual that is inviting you and I to follow him. That this is not some famous athlete, some famous influencer. This is Jesus, the son of the living God, who is it saying to you and saying to me, come. Follow me. I don't know if that does anything to your heart because sometimes we can hear preaching and, and, and hear messages and even read through words, the scripture, and just kind of go over it and glance over it. But if we take the time again to sit down and consider who it is 
that has said this to you and has said this to me, I think this then takes on a whole different meaning. That this is the king of glory. The uncreated one. The one who lived this world was yet sinless. The one who, who sits at the right hand of the Father. The Messiah. The one who, who, who takes away the sins of the world. This one whose name is Jesus is the one that is inviting you and inviting me to follow him. You see, when I read those words, follow me, and if you know me at any length, you know that I am a very um, task-oriented, goal-oriented, uh, to-do list type of an individual, very type A, just get it done, what needs to be done, give me a list of things to do, and, and when I read as a type A individual, a task-oriented individual, goal-oriented individual, when I see those words, follow me, I'm all for it. Because that tells me that we're going somewhere. And nothing excites a, a type A personality more than there's going to be an adventure. There's something to do. Come follow me. And, and that gets us going. And the next question then that we would, that we, our personalities would be asking is, okay, where are we going? What are we going to do when we get there? I see this picture, you, you, you see this picture of, you know, you go to the park and, and you see these um, dog owners with this stick with a tennis ball at the end of it and they whip that ball and, and the ball goes flying and, and this dog just runs off and, and, and excitedly goes after the ball, grabs the ball, comes back and, and, the, and the dog owner does it again and, and that's the life of the dog and he's just so excited just being busy with the same things over and over and over and I, that if, if, if we're going to be honest about it, sometimes some of us are like that. Follow me. Okay, let's go. What are we going to do? What, what area are we, you know, what, what part of community are we going to enter? with the kingdom of God and the gospel and, and what are we going to do? What mission trips are we going on to? And it's so easy to get excited over that and get very, very busy with things. Get busy with ministry. Get busy with life groups. I, I'm again, I'm not, we're all for all, all of these things. But when Jesus said, follow me, he was not calling his disciples, he's not calling you and I to follow him to do tasks. You see, I believe that you and I are much more comfortable getting busy with things because we're much more comfortable being busy than we are being vulnerable. When Jesus said, follow me, he was calling us to a relationship. When Jesus says, come follow me, he is inviting us into a relationship. That gets really uncomfortable sometimes for some of us. Because relationship requires us to be vulnerable. Requires us to be still. Requires us to be open before him. And that's why sometimes it's much easier for us to just be busy, 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 because I, I, can, I can let the busyness of my day mask whatever is going on in my heart. That's why some individuals are very uncomfortable with family time. We're okay as long as we're in army mode, but when it comes to family time, when it comes to relationships, we get very uncomfortable because now we have to face and deal with whatever really is going on in our hearts. When Jesus says, follow me, he is calling us to a place of deep, sincere, authentic relationship. Isn't that mind-blowing how Jesus' mission was worldwide and his objective was global, impacting the world, kingdom of God 
infiltrating, taking over the world and, and establishing the rule and reign of God and the, and on, on the earth. His, his, his mission and his goal was massive. But yet, he started it with relationship. His foundation was in relationship. Come, follow me. Follow me not from afar, but come, follow me up close. Share your life with me, and I will share my life with you. When Jesus, as Jesus called his disciples, he could have immediately, he could have immediately given them the task of things to do. But the very first thing that he established was, come, follow me, be with me. In Mark 3, this is made very clear. He called his, he, was, he came down from an evening of prayer up in the mountain. He comes down from the mountain and he calls his, the multitudes, his disciples to him. And in verse 14 it says, Then he appointed the twelve, he appointed twelve, that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. And to have power to heal sickness and cast out demons. That they might be with him. The Expositor's Bible commentary says this, they were to be brought into close association with the Son of God, to live with him, to travel with him, to converse with him, and to learn from him. The first call of any believer, of every believer, is the call to be with him. The first objective and the main priority of every follower, every disciple, every believer of Christ is to first and foremost be with him. Think about that for a minute. He is inviting you to be with him. It's hard for me to articulate just what that is doing in my own heart and in my own mind. But it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would do the same with you as he is continually and has been doing in my own life to recognize and realize that I, th this, this glorious Son of God is inviting me into a relationship with him to be with him it is out of our abiding and being with him that the gifts begin to flow notice that he says that they mark says that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons these are all the charismatic gifts the power gifts that is found in the holy spirit these are the things that many of us desire more of in our lives not so we can be puffed up but so we can be more effective in the ministry so that we can be effective in helping people and in setting captives free and in 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 uh, proving the truth and the authenticity of the gospel by the display of signs, wonders, and miracles. These are the things that many of us go after, but these can only be found, and this is what Mark is telling us, that these are, these are the byproducts of our relationship and being with Him. When the disciples did the signs, wonders, and miracles, they did not do it in their own power or their own knowledge or their own authority. It was because they had been with Jesus. In the book of Acts, the, the religious leaders, were their accusation against the, the, the disciples, they said, these men have come here and they have turned our world upside down. And they recognize them not as men who are learned or, or well-equipped, but that their recognition of them was that they had been with Jesus. You see, it's in our abiding and being with Him 
that the gifts begin to flow. It's in our abiding with Him that wisdom begins to flow. That clarity for decision making begins to flow. It's this invitation to be with Him and being with Him. We have all that we really need for life and godliness. It is in our proximity, our being with Him, that provision begins to flow and promotion then comes and spiritual gifts get activated. Spiritual power gets released. Godly desires and appetites begin to flow and we desire the things of God when we are and have been with Him. The power of God flows from our relationship with God. These are not things that we are to go after. These are not things that we are to pursue and strive for. What we are to pursue and strive for, there's only really one thing that you and I are, are, are instructed and, and encouraged and exhorted to go after, and that is Jesus himself. Everything else will fall into its right place at its right time when we have him central in our lives, when, 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 our, when our, we are one with him. We were in Niagara Falls this week and taking Karen over um, to, to show her about the only um, tourist site that could possibly impress somebody that is from Dubai. And that's about the only thing that they cannot make uh, in, in the Middle East. You know, um, we were there last year in the middle of a desert. They have a skating rink. They have a ski hill. They have a mall with an aquarium the size of this building with sharks and all kinds of fish. Everything that every, every nation has as a highlight, they made it over there, except they made it better. And so I figured we're, there's no other place that we can possibly take her that will impress her except for Niagara Falls. I don't think that they can recreate Niagara Falls in the middle of that desert. I don't care how much money they have. I just don't think that they can recreate Niagara Falls in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi. So we brought her to Niagara Falls. And as people were coming off, and some of you may be familiar with, you know, on the, on the U.S. side, it's the Maid of the Mist. On our side, I don't know what it's called, um, the, the version of it. We, they have the blue, the blue uh, ponchos. We have the red ones. I forgot the name of it. But these boats that will take you to as close to the falls as possible. And as people were coming off the boat, you realize that though they had ponchos and raincoats, they were soaked pretty much to the bone. And when it was our turn to get on the boat and, and we get on it, we do the touristy thing, and I'm trying to stay dry as best as I can. I had the poncho on, and, and, and as far as I could tell, it was the biggest one that they had. And it still only went down to my knees. The same poncho, on the other hand, went all the way down to Karen's ankles and to Pastor Happy's ankles. And so uh, all of us were there on this boat trying as best as well, I don't know about them, but for me, because I had to drive back home, I was trying my best to stay as dry as possible. But that didn't happen. Because, and, and I realized that the people that were coming off the boat, they weren't trying to get wet. They weren't exerting an effort to get wet. As hot as it was that day, and, and, and the, cool, uh, the cool water would have been refreshing, these individuals were not trying to get wet. In fact, they were trying to stay dry like I was trying to stay dry. But it was the proximity to the falls that you cannot help but get wet. It was your proximity to the mist and the power and the sound and the wind. There was wind around the falls that there was no wind anywhere else. But the closer you get to the falls, the stronger the wind became. And so your, your hair gets all, all messed up and, and you get all wet. Not because you're trying to mess up your hair. Not because you're trying to get wet. But it just so happened that your proximity to the falls, you can't help but get wet. You can't help but get messy. And you also can't help but be in awe of the God who created the falls. 
in the same way as we come and our, our, our gaze is, is focused on Him and He becomes our only, uh, not, not just the number one, but our only pursuit to, to focus all of our attention and our affection in this relationship that you and I have been invited into, all these other things shall then be added unto you. We don't have to strive for it. We don't have to work for it. It's in our abiding in the vine that the life that is flowing in the vine begins to flow into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds transformation begins to to flow into us and, and and our lives begin to change not because we are trying so hard to change but because the life of the vine begins to flow in us and the life of the holy spirit flows us and it is him who who begins a good work in us and brings it to completion jesus's desire for relationship didn't stop with his physical life on earth. That's why we see him, that we see this, his intention, his, his I don't want to use drive, but his, his um, you know, his, his uh, I don't know what the word is anymore, his longing to be with us. That in John 14, he says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. His intent in this relationship, if there's ever anything lacking Within this relationship, it is never on his end. He has done everything he can to ensure that this relationship remains intact. He has given his life. He has given his blood. He has released the Holy Spirit to be with us. It, all of this, not so we can feel guilty and be ashamed, but to show us just how, in, how, how intent he is how tenacious he is to be one with you and with me. And so, friends, my prayer today, again, I, I don't, we don't have time to finish the whole message, but my prayer today is for you and I, to, for our hearts to long for Jesus and for the Father again that we would not be satisfied merely by hearing the preaching of the word i am all for the preaching of the word obviously i'm a pastor i'm a i'm a preacher i i i'm we 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 desire preacher but that we would not settle just for the preaching that comes from this pulpit on Sundays or the life group that meets during the week or, or that we would just settle for any you know, teaching that we can get in, on, on YouTube, but that we would dive deep into who is this Father who so desires a relationship with me that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross so that my sins can be paid for, so that my guilt can be removed, so that I can be restored in relationship with him. Think about how, how, how intentional God the Father is. That he sent his son to die on the cross so that all hindrances between our relationship with him and his relationship with us would be removed. He sent his son to die on the cross so that we can be reinstated as sons, so that we can be reconciled and reunited again in that loving, intimate relationship. Jesus paid too much of a price just for you to go to heaven. Jesus paid the price so that not only will we spend eternity in heaven, but that so that we can experience heaven here and now, and we can have this relationship with the Father that we can be sitting at a traffic jam and still having the great, greatest time of our lives because we are communing with Him. I will never forget early on in 
my Christian life, when I encountered Jesus, there was no such thing as traffic that was too bad. And I was living in Cebu City. And you know, and in the Philippines, you know what traffic is like there. What used to drive me up the wall and I would be cussing and swearing and losing my temper and, and just having ruined the day. Because of what Christ has done and the initiation of his relationship with me and, 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 and the reunification of my, my relationship with the Father, I was able to sit through that same exact traffic and have that time where I am enjoying. It's okay that I'm not getting to where I need to be because I am where I have to be right now. I am in the presence of my Father, and I feel His presence. I feel His embrace. I feel, I, I, I sense the Father's affirmation. And any time that you have that, you have everything that you need. That's why Paul and Silas, even in the midst of that jail cell, in the middle of the night, they were able to pray, to praise, to worship, because the abiding presence of the Father was with them in that jail cell. And there's nothing that is happening externally that could rob them of the internal truth that they have been reunited with the Father in heaven. And He loves them. And he loves you and he loves me. And that knowledge is far too great for me to ever understand on this side of eternity. And he is calling our hearts back to that place of wonder and awe of who is this God that so desires a relationship with me. And as was quoted in our song and, and, and Janelle quoted today and the psalmist said today, or as the psalmist writes, what is man that you, O God, are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for me? I pray, church family, that all of us would go back to that place of awe and wonder, that we would not outgrow Oh, yes, the cross. Oh, yes, we're reconciled. Oh, yes, I'm forgiven. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm a son. Oh, yes, I'm a daughter of God. No, no, no. When you say it like that, you don't know what you are saying. Think about what you've, think about those words. I am forgiven. I am accepted. I am loved. I am cherished. I am celebrated. I am a child of God, and it's not because of anything I have ever done. It's because He has chosen me to be that. Let your heart be drawn to Him again, and let your heart come alive to the love of the Heavenly Father for you.